average citizens about the special privileges that they see members of Congress. Well, because your in the meantime, we'll bring you live coverage of the House Rules privileges. Committee as it takes well, up changes in House Rules that would limit gifts and, members of Congress uh, can receive. After that, that, work on a continuing um, resolution. I, I think, this would temporarily fund uh, government operations that, uh, while budget negotiations continue. And later, great. the committee and will determine the rules for debate on temporarily and, raising uh, the limit on the federal debt. The chairman is New York Representative Gerald Solomon. Substantial. Um, no, I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm right. saying if well, we well, do all this difference. thing, right. is it going to make any difference? Are they going to say, oh, those guys, they're up to the same trick. They just masked this and put it over here and did this? I think that one of the problems that the Congress has had is that there, there have been some people who have abused the privilege of being no in the about office. It. And this will make it more difficult for them to do that. And in that respect, I think it definitely will change. Now, you know, the tax were really brought about as a result of your organizations. You pushed uh, the PACs, and this not your organization, your organization. We pushed PACs? Didn't, wasn't PAC, a, wasn't PAC uh, when it came out, a, uh, a political movement forward, open, Mr. Open Chairman, well, can I? Actually, I think you got us reversed. Um, I, I was in the crowd that didn't want PACs at all. I think that... that no, let, let, uh, let me just say how PACs are created. This is just an opportunity that I think I really need to say. Okay. What happened was that labor was afraid, labor was the only one that had PACs. They were afraid they were going to lose their manpower training contracts because it said government contractors can't have PACs. So labor and business got together, repealed the prohibition that government contractors could not have PACs, and that is what led to the explosions of PACs. It was not a reform. Common Cause opposed it. All the people who were supporting campaign reform opposed it. It was not either an unintended well, I consequence. I, th I thought it was a, a move by business. You struck a spark with me. <laughs> it, I really wanted to say well, that because it's not. It, it really was an effort to enhance and the power of PACs, and of course they have grown enormously. I know, on the business side uh, especially. Uh, but both your organizations in particular have a great deal of persuasion with the average person because they look upon your organization as the cleanser of the Congress is the one who's got their eye on the Congress. What do we get if all this is passed? Are you going to come out and say, what a great Congress we got? Uh, uh, there's still so much more to do, and this is only a foot in a step. I mean, we don't mind getting uh, kicked in the shins every once in a while and getting tweaked every once in a while. But, we, you know, we'd like to get a pat in the back once in a while so we can don't walk around like Quasimodo. <laughs> we, try, we try and give you packs on the back, and uh, we do, in fact, I think that do that. Um, uh, you will definitely get a pat on the back if this package is, is passed. And, uh, but how many, I, I, how many pats, though? That's what I want to know. <laughs> well, um, I think you'll get one for this and one for campaign okay. finance reform and one for lobby. <laughs> no, Mr. Three quick Look, I, Mr. Milkley. In serious, I know we've got a very difficult task amongst us because it it does uh, encompass such a wide scope the comp the campaign the lobbyist reform the gift reform and it's a very energetic undertaking and and i'm sure that i would almost bet my year's salary that the bill that comes out of the senate is not going to be the same bill that passes the house so i mean there, there would have to be some uh give and take so i think that you owe it to us to keep your eye very closely on the amendments as they come through both parties so that we don't end up voting for something we think you people want, but you really don't want. M Mr. Moakley, let me just say I think we not only owe it to you, but we owe it to the American people who I believe desperately want really? a government they can be proud of, who really want a government that's not influenced by special interests. And I think that if Congress, as we hope and really believe is going to do this Congress, passes these fundamental reforms, lobby, gift ban, and most importantly, bipartisan fundamental campaign finance reform, we're going to be shouting it from the rooftops and we are going to be, re if it is fundamental and tough, we are going to be there because I think the American people 
need to feel proud, and, and I think this will make them proud of this Congress. I'd, I'd also like to say, uh, Mr. Mokri, that I think that it will make it easier for you as well uh, uh, in your um, experience as members of Congress. When you have the clarity of these rules and uh, when you have some um, greater limits on uh, both the gifts and the uh, campaign money. I hope so. I hope it will make it a better experience. And I know that it's a very tough job to be a member of Congress. You work extremely hard, harder than almost anybody else in America, and I do realize that. Uh, uh, and, um, and in many ways, you're, you're uh, to some extent victimized by the system. And so that's part of our reason for pressing It's a funny thing. We are victimized by the system. For the last 18 years, some of the local newspapers have been telling Congressman Gary Sedz to get out of the business. He no longer deserves, he no longer serves a function. He, he made an announcement the other day he was resigning. Now they're saying, he's quitting under fire. Why doesn't he stay? I mean, so, I mean, you can't win. I mean, there are some times you'd like the press to kind of be a little um, more uh, secure and a little more direct in their statements rather than criticizing you just because you're taking a, a step that they're not completely happy with. I, look, I, we jousted a little bit, but I, I did that purposely just to find out exactly, and, and that, I'm glad you straightened me out on that PAC situation, because up until now I was in error. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Claybrook and uh, Ms. McBride, I, I apologize. I'm going to recognize Mr. Linder, but I have to, I'm being summoned to a meeting on the uh, continuing resolution and the debt limit, and um, so I apologize for walking out, but we appreciate very much your coming. You. Mr. Goss, would you like to take over for minutes? Mr. I, Linder. I just have a couple of questions. Uh, Common Cause, you said, is a lobbying organization yes. and registers. And as public citizen also? Yes, we are a registered lobbyist, and I've been a registered lobbyist for many years. And, and all of your contributions, therefore, are disclosed? We disclose our contributions uh, under the Lobby Disclosure Act. It's <coughs> filed quarterly with the Clerk of the House and the Secretary of the Senate, and it, it is, as required by law, contributions of over $500 every one. Do you also disclose goes. what you spend the money on? Uh, yes. We Salary? Dis yes. Does public citizen do that? We disclose under the lobby law as it's required to be disclosed also. We do not disclose the addresses, for example, of our members, but we do disclose the... the uh, do you disclose the major contributors? Yes, we do. All right. Thank you. Mr. Bielenson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have no questions really other than just to <clears throat> thank both of you and your organizations for coming here and testifying. We, we appreciate your useful input on this very difficult very difficult matter suggest only that when you're through reforming us that you that you start reforming the electorate yes it is true that people want a congress they can be proud of but have you ever thought that we want constituents that we can be proud of <laughs> i can say these things now others can't and i don't know if they agree with me but to a great extent we are reflective and we do what the folks back home want us to do and if people don't like what's happening here in Washington, they should only look to themselves, if I may say so, with some respect and some lack of respect. Well, let, let me say, Mr. Uh, Bielenson, that... That can only be saying by a candidate non who, who, who's not seeking re-election. <laughs> I would just say if, if, if this body does what its constituents want it to do, what, if this body does what the constituents are asking of it, that they will this Congress will move to pass fundamental campaign finance reform because the American people are angry, they're demanding this, and I think that, uh, I hope that, that what you say is true on this particular issue. No, the sad truth, Anne, is that we can do all of these things and we should do all of these things, uh, and I doubt very much that uh, Congress is going to be held in very much higher repute by the people back home. You have a continuing problem of, of people, I don't know where they get these ideas from, I have some I think I know to a certain extent, but people who, who believe the worst and will continue to believe the worst and who are ill-informed about virtually everything that my colleagues and I and all of us up here uh, deal with uh, without going into the specifics of it, and somehow we're going to have to break through to them and educate them to what the real problems are, what the real issues are, what the real choices are, uh, and that's not really perhaps your, your job, but... Uh, Maybe you ought to turn, after, as in all seriousness, when you're through helping us reform ourselves to reforming the media and the people back home so at least people are well informed and they, and they know what the actual choices before us on their behalf are that we, we have to make here every day. 
Thanks. I would only say that um, one of the great American traditions is to be suspicious of people in power. Yeah, but suspicion's one thing. We, we're, we've gone way beyond that, right. Joan. No, way I, I beyond realize, that. I There's so much distrust out there that even, I mean, I, I said this sort of in jest almost the other day, but our Republican friends, there aren't all that many things that I'm that happy about. They're having won the, you know, won the majority for. But one of, the, one of them is that they're more serious. God bless them about balancing the budget than many of, many of my of our people in our, in our party were, although a lot of us in our party wanted and have been wanting for 10 years to do something uh, serious. Uh, there was something else good that they're doing. I can't remember what it is. Oh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not being facetious. They're going to they're gonna take some action on illegal immigration, which my party, for understandable reasons, has been, has been uh, hesitant about. But... But the incredible thing is, I mean, in a sense, if I may say this, I mean this nicely, I don't mean it for you folks who are here today, but they're, they're reaping some of this, whatever it is that they sowed over the last few years when they were in a minority and they really, you know, they thought they'd never win the place back and they said a lot of stuff because they didn't have the responsibility of, of running the, helping to run the government as, as they now do. And the people back home don't believe them anymore than they believe the Democrats. I mean, when 75% of Republican voters do not believe that, the, that our Republican colleagues plan to balance the budget will result in a balanced budget. I mean, it makes you want to just throw up your hands because, unfortunately, you know, it will. It will. I mean, it's not the way Mr. Boakley and Mr. Foss and I would like to go about balancing the budget, but in fact, they have a plan to balance the budget. Nobody believes them. Nobody believes them. And we can, we can reform ourselves till we're blue in the face on these things. And as I said, it's important that we do so, and we're going to do so, I hope. Certainly we will in this particular area, but we've got to go somehow beyond that. And one of these days, we hope that people like yourselves and the other folks who testified earlier will turn around and start directing our, your energies and our energies. One of the things I want to do when I'm out of here toward educating the people in this country to what the real problems are and, and how we, what we have to do to go about solving them. It's not going to be, they're not going to be solved by reforming Congress every couple of years, even though that's a, that's a nice thing to do and a useful thing to I do. I would just say, Mr. Bjornsson, real respectfully, that I, I believe and I know that you have spoken so passionately about the campaign finance issue that I think the money issue does is fundamentally underlying people's distrust. They, they, the Republicans have come into office, they passed the contract with America, but the American people believe it's business as usual. And I think that this reform is so important to not only to the reality of the way this place works and to the perception the, of, of the American people that I hope, and I will certainly work and our organization will work, to, to make clear that this is a profound change. It, it, it is not, I just think these reforms are not side issue to people's distrust and that they will have an impact. I know it, it well, doesn't gentlemen solve. Yield. Well, gentlemen, gentlemen yield. yield. Sure, I'll be happy to yield as long as I get a minute back at the end. Yeah, let me just say that the campaign finance issue is an important issue to you and to people in this town. In the last 30 town hall meetings I've done, it has not come up twice. Not twice. Uh, what they're interested in is balanced budgets in their children's future. And you have a vested interest because you raise money to pay your salary to keep after something like this. But the last thing the American people want to do is wind up raising their taxes to pay for these campaigns. Now, ceilings might be a good idea. Different ways of raising money. $1974,000 was a lot more money than it is now. But it just doesn't come up in my district. I, would, I need to take back my time if you're going to argue against public financing. Gentlemen, Neil. Of course. Uh, actually, what uh, Tony Bielan said. What uh, Tony Bielan said. Uh, said it is true. There are so many people out there. I have a saying that everybody looks at life through their kitchen window. And that's all they do. If it doesn't land on their kitchen table, it's not watching or thinking about. And I can see how people would get very suspicious of people spending a million dollars to win a $139,000 a year job. Uh, and especially when I represent, uh, I think my medium income in my district is like $25,000 a year. Sometimes we take raises that high. I mean, so I can imagine some fella getting ready to go to work in a truck, picking up the headline and saying, Congress raises such, well, of course, all day long, he's not going to say what a great Joe Mo guy Joe Mopley is. And I, I just think that we've got to stabilize this kind of communication and 
wages and everything else have got to go up at the same rate. And uh, we, we've just got to be as responsive, as responsive as we are, uh, we're probably just not responsive enough. And my papers all say that I'm as accessible as any congressman around, and I am. But still, that doesn't solve my problems because I'm not on every street corner every hour to answer everybody's question. And when you're away from the district for that long, things do happen uh, that you have no control over. You go back and, well, where were you last Monday? And this type of thing. So there's many, many things that happen. And secondly, I just want to bring to, to full light when I said I'd bet a year's salary it won't be the same bill. I mean, I don't mean just the gift bill. I mean the lobbying bill and the campaign finance bill. <laughs> May I, re <laughs> May I get yeah, back one I had on that one. <laughs> I get back my last minute. <laughs> I, I don't mean to be argumentative, but I guess I'm being argumentative. All I'm saying, all I'm saying is, if you have, you know, we can ban all gifts, we can ban all PAC contributions, and we can ban all lobbyists, whatever we're going to do with that. And I'm all for all of that. But when you have, and that that's good, as I said earlier, and we all believe it. I think I hope all of us believe it's good. But if you have 15 percent, if if you have the majority of Americans out there believing that we spend 15 percent of our of our of our budget on welfare when it's just under 1%. If you have 20%, if, if you have the, the majority of m members of the public believing that we spend between 15 and 20% of our budget on foreign aid when it's about two-thirds of 1%. When you have the public believing in general that we spend between around 20% of our money for fraud, waste, and abuse, on fraud, waste, and abuse. So they get angry when our friends over there quite properly are trying to slow the rate of growth of Medicare. They say, why do you have to slow Medicare? We, you know, that's a good program. Why don't you cut fraud, waste, and abuse? I mean, you can do all these other things, and we should, and we're going to, and we could, and whatever. But until you have some folks out there, you know, more, I mean, a critical mass of them who have some understanding of what this is all about and what the choices are, they're never going to be happy with us or with their country or with themselves or whatever. And all I'm suggesting with greatest respect is after you finish reforming us this year, I hope, or next year, turn around and start doing something about, in, about reforming the electorate and all of us in the country so that we can so that we'll, we'll, we'll be able somehow to solve these problems together because people are so uninformed or ill-informed as they currently are. There's no way, there's no way we can do the right things up here no matter who's in charge, no matter how we try, no matter how many times we, we reform ourselves. That just won't do it. Well, we agree with uh, what you said, at least I do. And uh, I would say that we do work on a number of issues besides this, oh, I know you public do. citizen. And we certainly do try mm -hmm. and help uh, educate our constituency and the American public. Uh, um, but there, we have a long way to go, and it goes to our educational system and a lot of other issues, as you know. Um, and I, but I do think that, that when the public sees the Congress reform itself, then it's much more open-minded to, to understanding and listening to what the Congress has to say. Hope you're right. Thank you, Mr. Bielman. Ms. Walthals? Thank you. I thank you for your testimony. I agree with you that this is one of three things that we need to take care of in this Congress, along with the lobbying reform, lobbying disclosure reform, and campaign finance reform. I, we may disagree on what the, the result should be of campaign finance reform, but I think it's clear that the current system is so riddled with loopholes. And if you've got bundling that, that's permissible, so you've got one group that, because of the way they wrote the checks, can give $100,000 to one, to one candidate, we have a pr a program that has been in place long enough for people to figure out how to get around it. And I think we need to change it. But I think this gift ban bill, uh, gift reform, is part and parcel of changing the climate of how business is done in Washington. So I appreciate your support on the bill and hopefully, uh, I think we have heard some good things today that I think we can strengthen the bill and improve it over what the Senate's done and, and hopefully we'll have your support when we do that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walthals. Do you have any final words? Anybody else have any further questions for this panel? Final words? If not, thank, thank you. you. Just thank you very, very much. Thanks. We will now uh, dismiss the second panel, Ms. Claybrook of Public Citizen and Ms. McBride of Common Cause, and call a third panel, Mr. Wright Andrews of the American League of Lobbyists and Mr. Richard Brown of the Leukemia Research Fund. When there's room, come to the table. <laughs> Thank you. And while we're waiting, I would like to uh, put into the record without objection a letter to Chairman Solomon from Mr. Donald uh, Ainge, who's the Executive Vice President of MGIS Companies.
relevant to the testimony of this panel. I believe we will start with Mr. Andrews for the American League of Lobbyists. When we get the room clear. I thank you very much for coming forward today and helping us with our uh, very difficult task here. Uh, I think uh, there are many dimensions to this. Uh, there have been two separate panels where we've heard uh, dimensions from certain perspectives, and uh, I believe we are now going to get a third and a fourth perspective, which will be very helpful to the committee in its efforts. Uh, we welcome you. We would accept into the record your testimony without objection and welcome your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am Wright Andrews, a partner in the law firm of Butera and Andrews in Washington, D.C. I am a lobbyist, and today I am appearing as president of the American League of Lobbyists. Since there has been so much discussion today about what a lobbyist is, what lobbyists may or may not do, et cetera, I'd like to make a couple of opening observations before commenting on the bill. That is that basically I think most of us would agree today in Washington that uh, a lobbyist is someone's representative uh, and indeed someone's advocate. Uh, here, most of us think of it in terms of someone who is being paid to represent someone. As I will cover more in my testimony as we go along, I think it is very important, however, for the committee to recognize that the gift rule uh, has implications that uh, should be addressed more than in just terms of lobbyists. Uh, it is more than someone who technically qualifies under the definition of a registered lobbyist that is trying to influence legislation. And uh, we will be suggesting some broadening this rule to cover others. Now let me say that uh, I think the committee clearly knows that lobbying is a completely legitimate and necessary part of the democratic process. It's a fundamental protected constitutional right. And professional lobbyists, such as all's members, are performing a critically important role, helping people communicate factual information to members of Congress and their staff. I would suggest that every member of this committee has constituents, many constituents, who are in fact special interest, according to what the media might say. Those constituents, uh, many of them have lobbyists representing them in Washington for a variety of reasons. People, be they corporations or individuals, today, perhaps more than ever before, have a very real need to have lobbyists in Washington. The decisions that government makes impacts heavily on them. In many cases, it is simply impossible or impractical for them to come to Washington, and accordingly, they will retain a professional lobbying advocate here in Washington to communicate their interest to you in Congress. There is nothing wrong with that. Indeed, there is something very right with that in the democratic process. Uh, at the same time, we fully recognize that there is a tremendous misperception about lobbying. Many people do think that Congress is corrupted with lobbyists constantly lavishing gifts uh, upon members and staff. Congressional gift rules, the lobby disclosure law, and certainly the campaign finance laws can and indeed should be amended. The American League of Law Lobbyists has long advocated change, for example, to the lobbying disclosure law. We have also supported strengthening and clarifying congressional gift rules. We do so for the reasons that we recognize that better, clearer rules are in everyone's interest. They will increase public understanding and acceptance of the lobbying profession. We believe that such enhancements will also increase public confidence in the integrity of the legislative process. While there are many things 
right with this legislation today. And I commend the sponsors for coming forward with uh, suggestions. Uh, as I will highlight in a moment, I think that there are a number of defects in it that uh, even those, uh, regardless of what side one might be on, whether you want tougher legislation or weaker legislation, I would say it cuts both ways. And uh, I have attached to my statement an appendix that covers a few of those points. Mr. Chairman, today I want to emphasize that the American League of Lobbyists feels very strongly that whatever rules are adopted with respect to gifts, should be drafted so that they apply to everyone who has a direct and active interest in legislation. The rules should not simply be targeted at gifts by individuals who are registered lobbyists. We would submit that the restriction should apply on a cross-the-board basis to a lobbyist clients, to the client's offices and employees, and to others with a direct legislative interest, such as uh, a lobbyist business partners or co-workers. The rules should not be riddled with loopholes that will allow a few lobbyists or interested parties to provide certain valuable items that <coughs> others cannot do. All encourages the House to, to adopt a gift rule that is balanced even-handed, workable, and effective, and particularly that's clear to all participants. Right. HRES 250 certainly provides a framework for developing such a rule. However, as is so often the case, uh, the old line, the devil is in the details, I would submit, applies here. When you look at the details of this legislation, as several of your earlier witnesses have pointed out, there are some provisions that are unclear. I think there are loopholes. I think there are provisions that are overreaching. Uh, I would suggest that it is important for this committee, instead of just rushing to pass it, uh, that you take time to carefully reflect on these and try to make improvements in the legislation. To mention several examples that are cited in my testimony at the appendix beginning on page 5, I would note with respect to the dollar limits involved, uh, it would be quite easy to game these limits to avoid them by splitting the cost of meals between a number of people. I can assure you this would be done. Uh, with respect to how members operate under this rule, it is fine for that members do not want to be overburdened with excessive record keeping, but I would submit that without records, it will be very difficult at best to keep track of your annual contribution limits. Uh, I am afraid that the press and congressional critics will soon be attacking this rule as it is adopted, saying that it is really a 55 mile an hour speed limit that nobody pays attention to, and that it's business as usual if some of these issues aren't addressed. I would also suggest that I do think the committee needs to consider whether the basic dollar limits uh, here, the $50 limit, uh, is too low, at least as long as you have disclosure. For example, under this legislation, a $51 dinner would be prohibited. At the same time, someone can take and pay for a member or staffer's trip to Palm Springs for several days with the expenses, et cetera, running up thousands of dollars. Now, I ask, does this really make sense? Does it compute? Uh, I, would, I would submit that uh, many people in the public have been most concerns about, concerned about so-called junkets, and yet the legislation uh, allows people to continue to travel. Now, I am not saying that people should not be allowed to travel. The point of that, 
I am simply making is that I believe that you will be attacked and I think uh, there needs to be consistency. Also with respect to the exceptions which many people talked about earlier in the testimony today, just to highlight a few points, there is an exception for political contributions. Uh, I would suggest that if you look, however, at the definition of political contribution as defined under election law, guess what? It has a lot of exceptions too. And a number of those exceptions, such as um, hosting a political event at my home where I could furnish up to a thousand bucks in food, beverages, and so forth, under election law, that's not a contribution. Uh, people do do that all the time. Yet under this legislation, uh, I think it I think it is. I think that's something that may be technical, but that you you need to address. With respect to personal friendships, I think that is extremely problematic. The personal friendship exception. Uh, you know, I, I think in real life, and certainly in this town, people have very mixed motives for uh, much of what they do. And I do not know whether you need a primary purpose or principal purpose test, but is it all right if 5% of why I take why I pay for something uh, is maybe you could help me and 95% is because you're my friend, etc. I think those are very difficult things. I would also suggest that, it, that to the extent you establish that there is a uh, personal friendship, you might want to have some type of cumulative uh, limit with there too. The bill presently provides $250, but I think as long as I could say it's personal and friendly, I could, could do $249 uh, activities day after day. I suggest you look at that. Uh, the bill provides an exception for state and local governments. It says anything paid for by state and local government. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, as you and the members of this committee know, lobbying by state and local governments is big business today. They lobby on their own. They have operations here. They hire outside lobbyists. Uh, they have millions, indeed billions of dollars, I suppose, at stake. Yet they can pay for anything. Does it make sense to have an exception uh, for them? Uh, I think you should treat all parties across, across the board. Uh, with respect to personal hospitality, uh, the provision here says that one cannot extend so-called personal hospitality uh, if you are a registered lobbyist. Um, I think the way this is worded, uh, a registered lobbyist rich individual client who's seeking millions of dollars in tax breaks could very easily under this uh, provide some really nice personal hospitality, a week at their hunting lodge or whatever at least on the wording of this. I'm sure that's not necessarily the intent, but I do think that is uh, the way this is worded. Um, likewise, with respect to items such as free attendance at events, certainly the members want to have free attendance at receptions, etc. Uh, interestingly, it, it contains a clause that says that one uh, could not accept uh, food or drink refreshments if they're not in a group setting in which substantially all of the participants participate. Uh, think of the constant conventions that are held here in Washington and elsewhere that all members flock to to meet with their constituents. They are frequently invited to uh, a smaller dinner uh, as a part of that. Could they not eat with their constituents? Could they not eat with the board of directors? Those are points that um, I think need clarifying. Um, reimbursements. Uh, reimbursements can be provided under the exception by an individual other than a lobbyist. Uh, that suggests that an individual who is interested in legislation, trying to influence legislation, uh, can somehow, it's okay for them to reimburse the member and it's not a, not a gift, not anything, but the, a registered lobbyist cannot. Uh, that's absurd. Uh, also, with respect to the definition of a registered lobbyist, which was referenced here today a number of times, uh, I certainly and all strongly support lobbying reform legislation, as I mentioned earlier, uh, but the legislation that's being considered 
uh, for lobbying disclosure, which you cross-reference here, does not necessarily uh, do what I suspect you intend. For example, as I gave an, uh, uh, an example in the testimony, that uh, has an exception for someone who spends less than 20% of their time on work for a client, uh, then you're not a lobbyist. Well, I can tell you as a lawyer who represents clients from time to time, that would hit me. I could, I could do $25,000 worth of lobbying work. And lo and behold, under that legislation, I'm not a lobbyist. Uh, that doesn't, to me, make sense. Uh, I would suggest, again, that whatever rules that are adopted, they should be clear. They should apply across the board to whoever has an interest or financial stake. Uh, you can play with the wording. There are some other models out there. But it certainly should not apply just to lobbyists or lobbying firms on any of these provisions. And I think it is very important that you do not create two classes of, of lobbyists in some way where certain, if you will, fat cats can do certain things and others can't. Uh, I do not think that uh, the thousands of Washington lobbyists that uh, are here constantly representing the people back home uh, are doing dishonorable things in general. There are a few bad apples from time to time. Uh, I think most of us uh, are ready to live with any reasonable limitations, and uh, we stand ready to work with the Congress to uh, try to come up with legislation that is workable on all three areas that have been referenced today, gifts, campaign reform, and lobbying disclosure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Andrews. We will we'll get to questions. I want to give Mr. Brown the opportunity, uh, as the clock is ticking, to make sure he gets his uh, opportunity to testify before us. And Mr. Brown, we welcome you. We uh, I've read of your background, of the charitable work you've done, and I commend you and congratulate you, and I'm very happy to welcome you here today. Um, I hope you will give us a perspective, as I know you're going to, on the charitables, uh, because they are a part of this and they have not really been much discussed yet so far in these hearings. Your prepared statement will be accepted in the record without objection, and we welcome your comment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I'm Richard H. Brown. I'm uh, the founder and the chairman emeritus of the Leukemia Research Fund, the University of Minnesota. One of our largest contributors is at Annie Thompson Memorial Golf Tournament in Sun Valley, Idaho. This has gotten a lot of uh, comments in the last several years and picked up press. And, and uh, whether it's the Danny Thompson or many other tournaments, uh, I think we need to look at uh, what might really be some of the reasoning behind why a tournament is really a tournament. Um, this tournament, uh, as I said, is a large contributor, the largest contributor to the Leukemia Research Fund today. We've raised over $4 million since I started this project in 1971. Uh, the Danny Thompson Tournament has uh, raised over $3 million since it started 19 years ago. A million and a half of that has gone to our project. The background of uh, the Danny Thompson Tournament is that we have uh, both people from uh, the world of sports, people from the entertainment industry and congressmen at this tournament. It seems like the press picks up the fact that we have just congressmen at the tournament as celebrities. We believe that, and, and I have played in this tournament for 19 years, and I have yet to see lobbying take place. These people are out there to do a job and to do a job effectively. I am not familiar with lobbying. I am not a lobbyist. I'm a private individual. This is the first time I've ever been to one of these things. So this has all been new to me today. I've kind of had a good experience at it. And uh, I think that we need to look at whether this whole project, uh, which is terribly complex, and I, I really uh, give all of you a lot of credit for, for having uh, the responsibility to have to challenge it. Um, but I don't think you ought to be looking at this thing as uh, something that you can throw the baby out with the bathwater. Now, let me tell you a little bit about our tournament, our, our uh, Leukemia Research Fund and what it does so that you can see where some of the money really goes and why it's so important to have uh, the funds that we do. Uh, we have um, a peer review process 
We have an outside peer review committee, people outside the state of Minnesota. We've had Nobel Prize winners, Cancer Research Prize recipients, uh, Lasker Award recipients, the past president National Cancer Review Council, uh, members of the National Academy of Science, as members of our review committee. The job of this group is to evaluate new innovative science. When a scientist goes to National Cancer Institute and gets funding, he is, uh, or she, is uh, taking a grant from point A to point B. Sometimes along that track, they find different routes, a C to E or an E to F. There is not funding for that. If one of those looks promising, this is where we come in to play. If that grant passes our peer review, which is very strict, we will step up to the plate and fund that grant. I'm going to give you an example of one of these success stories. <clears throat> just happened this year, as a matter of fact. In 1990, we funded one of our grants, and uh, it was a two-year type of funding. Uh, at the end of that time, the scientists had discovered a smart bomb approach to leukemia. Uh, the smart bomb seeks out the receptor sites on the cell membrane, attaches to it, and a bomb is delivered. The bomb happens to be a derivative of soybeans. It has no side effects to date. It has a 100% kill ratio. This is a profound discovery. And it all came from money supplied by the Danny Thompson tournament. Now, just because there are a few congressmen that come out to the tournament, the press comes around and says how terrible this tournament is. This tournament has made tremendous accomplishments through our Leukemia Research Fund project. And I think that we need to look at how difficult this job is for you to sort these things out. Um, Congressman Dan Burton from Indiana has supplied a list of ideas that we hope will be thought of and reviewed that I think makes some sense, allowing people to be able to do things in a more orderly and effective manner. And I think that, that the success of products or projects like ours uh, come about because of teamwork from all kinds of people in all walks of life. And I appreciate you allowing me to give you a little background on where some of this money really goes and why we think it's important to allow these people to be there. The end of it is, if they aren't there, Corporate America is not going to be a sponsor. They're going to sponsor something else. They're going to find that congressman in some other way to talk to him about whatever it might be. So I think it's important to look at how you can keep things moving along. And let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. I, I, um, the whole issue of how members of Congress use their official cachet for good causes such as the one you're involved in is a very difficult issue and one the ethics committees on both uh, both houses both the house and the senate have struggled with for some time and i doubt we're going to find the wisdom to get the right answer uh, in the next 48 hours but it is a very important issue and uh, your testimony has been valuable on that point and i appreciate it this rule does not prohibit members of congress from uh, participating in such events and actually, I think it even allows members to participate in the, uh, with no greens fees. What it does require is the members pay to the scene of the uh, wherever the, uh, the tournament is held and has to pay their own way. Uh, and I think that's the difference between what the rule is now. Um, uh, we haven't quite worked all of that out yet, uh, what the impact would be. But I think that is the, the size of the dilemma. But the rule does not ban members from playing in celebrity tournaments. One of the things you said about it is one of the problems we have with perception. What is the purpose of the member? The member is the bait for corporate America to come. There is something that is mildly distasteful uh, about that thought in many Americans' minds. So they're saying, gee, my member of Congress is out there doing something good. Yes, that's true. But really, he's being used as bait uh, for some other people who want to talk to them about something else. I and mean, whether I would not appreciate anybody interfering with my golf game, it's bad enough. Uh, and if I were to be distracted by somebody trying to ask me for something official uh, while I was doing it, it would probably make me mad. Uh, the image of the congressman as a celebrity, however, and, and lending some weight to a charitable uh, function, which is uh, of good benefit, 
is a different issue than the lobbying issue. And we are trying to draw that thin line, and it's a very thin line indeed. Um, Excuse me, where, where did the Clint Eastwards and the baseball players and so forth show a difference? The, the issue, of course, is that I work for the taxpayers uh, and they work for a private concern. And that is a very important issue because we are accountable to the taxpayers. So uh, while I'm a congressman uh, and I am in control of my time, I'm accountable for seven days a week, 24 hours a day of what I do as a public official to the people I work for, which happen to be the 561,000 people of the 14th District of Florida. And the rest of America has a little piece of me too. And I think we all feel that way here. Um, and on the other hand, I want to stand up for some wonderful uh, charitable event uh, and one wonderful charitable cause and say, of course, Americans, and in my leadership role as a member of Congress and using that and say, this is something I'm happy to bring to your attention. It deserves your support uh, as a private citizen. I think that's proper. But the mechanics of getting corporate America in to pay for the tournament to get the, the members there is where we start getting into the troubled areas of what a gift is. Now, would the members go? Probably in many cases they'll go anyway uh, and just pay their own ticket uh, to get out there. And that's my hope, wherever it will be. Uh, and I think that's the solution we're looking to now. Um, okay. Thank you very much. I, I, that is not a definitive answer. That's just uh, dialogue back with you after very good testimony from you. And I do appreciate you. I, you say this is your first time uh, testifying in Washington. I, I'm pleased that you came here. You. I don't know who paid for your trip here. Um, <laughs> but, but I'm glad you, you did come. Yeah. And I hope it was a good experience, as you indicated. Yes. Uh, it's interesting to watch how government works. Yes, it is. Very interesting. And I do have a plane to catch, if you don't mind. I don't mind at all. Ms. Walholz, do you have a question? Just a couple of comments. Thank you. First, Mr. Brown, I, I am very sympathetic to your concerns about these events. We have had a couple of events in my home district sponsored by the senators who represent our state that have raised money for causes that are unquestionably causes supported by virtually everyone in our state. And as Mr. Goss indicated, we are struggling to find the appropriate means to have members of Congress continue to be good citizens in trying to support uh, worthy charities, but at the same time not serve as the attraction, if you will, for corporate America to do what we'd like to see them do without having a member of Congress there to be the reason for their contribution. I, I would hope that members of Congress, if this rule goes through it's as it's written, I would hope that members of Congress will still feel the, the, uh, the desire to go and help these various organizations, even if it means that we have to spend some money out of our own pockets to do it. And I suspect that some will continue to do that. So I want you to know I, I'm sympathetic to your concerns, but we're trying to address a concern that I think is a legitimate one of the people who expect us to come here and to make judgments that impact their lives, that impact the money that they send us to spend on their behalf, and they feel that sometimes we are being influenced in ways and by people that they don't have the equal opportunity to share in. And that's what we're trying to address through this legislation. Uh, Mr. Andrews, I, I would simply say, and I'll, I'll say in full view of C-SPAN and the world, that, that I have nothing against lobbyists per se. I have been the recipient of a lot of good information from lobbyists, some not so good, just the same as any other place where I get information. I think there is a very important role that lobbyists play, as you have correctly identified, that not everyone can afford to come here in person, that they, they hire other people to do that on their behalf. They try to hire people who know the ins and outs of how government works and how legislation is made. But I, I think that there is a legitimate concern that the public has about the way business has become conducted in Washington as a matter of course. Just last week I was not at a meeting but, but someone who was there uh, familiar with what I'm doing on this bill was in attendance where a registered lobbyist of a large corporation with interests in my state was talking about what they could do to help raise money for Republican freshmen. And the statement was made that they felt a lot better about helping raise money for people who didn't have anything to do with gift ban legislation. That is the kind of problem that the public perceives as being precisely what is wrong 
with how government is run in this city. That someone would care enough and feel that their ability to influence legislation is sufficiently impacted by this legislation. That they are going to make a decision as to who they try to support in terms of, of re-election fundraising as to whether or not they support this legislation. It is a relationship that the public is not comfortable with. And I think that through this legislation and through some of the other legislation that we've been talking about today with regard to reform, the public can feel more assured that what they perceive is the wrong way to do business and the wrong way to get legislation made can, can be positively changed. So again, I, I am not anti-lobbyist, but I do think that there has sprung up too cozy a relationship between in a nexus around lobbyist campaign financing, gifts, and, and we need to address it. Mr. Chairman, if I just might comment briefly, I certainly uh, recognize, as I think I indicated, that the public does have concerns. I think, uh, as several of the members have indicated today, there is both legitimate reason in some cases for the concern. There's also misinformation, misunderstanding on the public's uh, part. Um, I would emphasize again, though, that it's very important that the members recognize, uh, and indeed that the public recognize, that the way business is done in Washington is far more than, involves far more than just the lobbyist. Today, more than ever, lobbying, or at least attempting to influence legislation, is being moved back to the home districts and states. Uh, through grassroots lobbying, through all types of activities with constituents. So again, my point that anyone who has an interest in seeking to influence legislation should be treated essentially the same under this proposal. And again, I think there are many good things in your proposal. I think, as I've suggested, there are areas that need to be clarified and tightened uh, or modified in some way. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Anders. I just wanted to, I, I deferred to Mr. Brown first and uh, appreciate your patience on that. Uh, I hope you don't have a plane to catch also you're about to miss. If you do, <laughs> I'll tell you this will be quick. Uh, I wanted to assure you that uh, I kept close score of the points you made out of the devil in the details part of your presentation. I didn't we, hit them all. <laughs> I, I know you didn't. Uh, we found several others. We've been doing this all weekend uh, with staff and trying to do end game scenarios, what if, what if. Uh, we've gone through a lot of those what ifs and I think we could probably come up with some pretty fair responses to most of them. But I will, will say two things on this. Um, I don't know if you were in the room earlier when I said this does shut down a lot of what uh, we will call traditional lobby practice in this town by what we call registered lobbyists, whatever they are and whatever that is. It does create a difference. There, it does separate lobbyists from non-lobbyists. There's no question about that. It makes that distinction, and you're right to point it out, and that will be certainly part of the debate. The second point in that, uh, I think, uh, is that I think it further, as you pointed out, distinguishes between inside the Beltway lobbyists and other lobbyists, not by intent, but by uh, practical application of the way this thing will work. Uh, I agree that the, the potential uh, scrutiny for what I will call a Washington lobbyist will be much greater, uh, and the rules are much tighter than for lobbyists who are elsewhere, for the very reason you point out, people hire people in Washington, particularly attorneys, to look out for their interests, uh, and, and it's, that is the target zone for much of this. There's no question about that, and you're right to point it out. Um, and I think that weighing the fairness of that is going to be, a, a, again, an important part of the debate of this. And the third, the last point I would make is that uh, I, I will say that uh, I think it is very definitely possible for lobbyists to provide great services to members coming to their offices and sharing information of, of a nature or of a technique or of a profession or of a specialty or of a niche that the member may not be familiar with or the staff may not be with, uh, familiar with and allowing that person to uh, bring themselves up to speed on one side, admittedly it's always one side of an issue, full well knowing that there are other sides of the issue if you're the member. I think that business can be done uh, in a member's office, frankly, without gifts. Um, and I think that's the way it should be done. That's why the taxpayers have given us such great offices. But I also think it should be done in a way that we don't discriminate intentionally against uh, lobbyists from reasonable and fair pursuits of uh, spreading information which is useful. Uh, and trying to tread that line is where we are. 
Thank, thank you for those comments, Mr. Chairman. And again, I would say that that the question of what is a lobbyist, uh, I would submit that essentially anyone that is seeking to influence uh, legislation uh, should be swept within similar provisions. Uh, an individual, for example, uh, who may be a corporate CEO uh, may spend a great deal of time lobbying uh, on behalf of a position for that company. Uh, that individual, it seems to me, should be covered by the same gift type restrictions. So I'm sure the committee will do its best to deal with these issues. You've, you've got your finger on some of the tougher parts of this one. Thank you very much for your testimony. It is of value to us, and we are very grateful for you coming forward. The uh, third panel is dismissed, and at this time the Rules Committee is scheduled to mark up and report the gift rule resolution at 10 a.m. on Thursday. That would be this Thursday. The committee will reconvene at 445 or thereabouts for a hearing on the Alaska Oil Export Conference report. We expect to meet at 8 p.m. tonight on the continuing appropriations resolution. The debt limit will be before us tomorrow. So says Chairman Solomon. This meeting is concluded. Thank you, Mr. Anders, very much.